Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us and tuning into today's Milken Institute conference call series event. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Eric Kaplan, director of the Milken Institute Center for Financial Markets Housing Finance Program. Each week, the Milken Institute convenes a diverse group of leaders to explore a different industry, region, or sector that's responding to the challenges that we're facing and outline solutions for positive impact in response to these challenges. Previous calls have covered topics from vaccine development to strategic philanthropy to the market implications of the coronavirus. Future calls that are currently in development include the impact revolution, building the investment pipeline for an inclusive economy, that's next Wednesday, July 22nd, and ensuring access to capital for minority-owned businesses, and that's on August 5th. But today we have with us a very special guest, and it's my pr uh, pleasure and privilege to welcome to the Milken Institute conference call series, the director of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, Kathleen Kraninger. Director Kraninger became the second confirmed director of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, also called the CFPB, uh, in December 2018. From her early days as a Peace Corps volunteer to her role establishing the Department of Homeland Security, to her policy work at the Office of Management and Budget, and to the CFPB, Director Kraninger has dedicated her career to public service. And again, it's my privilege to welcome her to today's event. The Bureau was established in 2011 under Dodd-Frank uh, to provide a single point of accountability for enforcing federal consumer financial laws and protecting consumers in the financial marketplace. The financial crisis made very clear how important this mission is, and certainly the COVID-19 pandemic has created new and truly unprecedented challenges. But the CFPB has been an, CFPB has been an agency at work, uh, both in carrying out its day-to-day -day mission and responding to the plight of consumers in the pandemic. We'll be talking about that today. We're also fortunate to help Director Kraninger and the CFPB kick off Consumer Financial Protection Week, which runs from today until July 17th. Now for some housekeeping matters, we always have housekeeping matters. Uh, please note that today's event is open to and intended for a public audience, and that the director will discuss the work of the Bureau as relevant for the topics at hand. The event's being video recorded and will be available for public viewing on the Milken Institute website shortly after it ends. Also, Director Kraninger's participation today is not in any way tied to the Milken Institute, nor should it be construed as an endorsement or promotion of the Milken Institute, uh, uh, sorry, of, of the Milken Institute by the Bureau or of the Bureau by the Institute. And as a final disclaimer, I also serve as the Vice Chair of the CFPB Consumer Advisory Board, or the CAB as we call it, since in DC everything has to have an acronym. Uh, the CAB is mandated under Dodd-Frank and consists of a diverse appointed group of stakeholders who help inform the CFPB about practices and trends in the consumer finance industry. We share analyses and recommendations to help the Bureau carry out its mission, but we do not represent the Bureau nor our opinions or recommendations binding upon the Bureau in any way. So with that boilerplate out of the way, I'd like to welcome Director Kraninger uh, to the conference call series, and I now turn it over to the director for some comments before we turn to our fireside chat. So Director Kraninger, welcome, and thank you for joining us today, and we're thrilled to have you here with us during Consumer Financial Protection Week. Uh, good morning uh, to you, Eric. It's fantastic to see you, and good morning, uh, and thank you for joining us to everyone else who's, who's joined today. I think it's a, a fantastic opportunity to talk about the great work that the CFPB does, and as you noted, to launch uh, Consumer Financial Protection Week. I, I certainly want to thank uh, the Milken Institute for inviting me and, and kicking us off here, and you personally, Eric, as you noted, serving as vice chair of our Consumer Advisory Board and, and playing a really uh, important role, uh, as I believe all of our boards and councils do, in supporting uh, the ability of the agency to carry out its important mission. So you provide uh, fantastic uh, advice and, and insights, and, and uh, certainly all of the members of the councils do, and really appreciate you taking that, uh, that time to, to serve uh, with us. Uh, so as we noted, we're uh, kicking off Consumer Financial Protection Week. Uh, we conceived of this uh, many months ago, uh, actually, and in, in particularly in light of the 10-year ten, ten anniversary of the enactment of the Dodd-Frank Act, certainly our founding statute and, and seminal to the financial services industry generally. Um, we had been planning uh, to do a series of events, again, to highlight the great mission of the Bureau and the work that we do every day to support consumers. And so we're starting this week uh, with the Milken Institute and, and talking uh, uh, on a wide range of issues uh, and certainly focusing a little bit on, on housing policy. 
but we have a number of events this week talking about uh, special populations uh, of consumers who are affected uh, in different ways uh, in the financial services uh, space. And so what we do to support them, we have the opportunity to talk about our supervision and enforcement tools and how those work to protect consumers in the marketplace uh, and, and uh, our fair lending uh, work, I would also highlight. So a number of uh, fantastic things that we'll highlight this week and we'll certainly carry forward. Um, I can tell you too that with the ongoing pandemic, it is even more important uh, to remind American consumers that the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau is here uh, working on your behalf on a regular basis. Uh, before the pandemic hit under my leadership, the Bureau was focused on its four primary goals and how we carry out our mission, providing clear rules of the road uh, through rulemaking, creating a culture of compliance through supervision, enforcing the law against bad actors, and educating and empowering consumers to make better informed decisions in the consumer financial marketplace. Uh, none of that has changed over the last several months, but clearly there is no doubt that COVID-19 pandemic has had a profound impact on our country, on our economy, and on our individual lives. Uh, since the pandemic started, the Bureau has been engaged, shifting gears when necessary in these extraordinary times to continue to protect consumers in the marketplace using the tools I just outlined, uh, and with a particular focus as well on making sure that we are providing uh, great resources for consumers to come to on our website, which I'll talk a little bit about. So when, um, when the pandemic first emerged and we realized that there were going to be some profound impacts, uh, we looked uh, very much to our stakeholders. Uh, I had calls with advisory board and council members, as Eric knows, as a part of that. Uh, ongoing conversations with consumer advocates, with uh, those in the financial industry, uh, talking about what they're seeing in the marketplace, sharing what our observations are, what impacts that's going to have on consumers, and then what actions the Bureau needs to take. We have been acting uh, in an incredibly uh, agile and proactive way to be responsive to what consumers' needs are. Uh, we want to be that resource and rock for consumers. And so, as I said, we really, uh, starting first and foremost with our education efforts, uh, have put uh, extensive resources on our website. We've had 2.8 million consumers come to consumerfinance.gov uh, since the pandemic started. We have produced incredible uh, videos and uh, blogs and trying to push out content via every means. Uh, stakeholders, uh, including members of Congress, state and local government officials, um, our fellow federal uh, agency heads, and, and pushing out again all of this information to make sure that we are responsive to the questions and the issues that uh, consumers are facing right now and providing that clarity. Uh, it, we all know there, there was definitely a lot of evolving uh, information and and even evolving protections and rights that Congress provided through the CARES Act enactment. And so being able to uh, pivot quickly, being able to assess where there might still be questions uh, in the marketplace and then responding to that uh, with products and information and really seeking to align uh, with our partners. I, I, I give uh, frankly everyone credit for that done a lot of things and, and getting feedback from um, that full community of where where are their challenges, where are consumers that are contacting their um, their lenders and creditors, where are the questions coming into play, uh, consumer advocates trying to assist uh, those out there across the country, where is there some kind of confusion about how uh, a consumer should engage or what they should expect, um, because so much about uh, making a, a fair, transparent, competitive financial marketplace work, as is our mission under the statute, is setting those expectations, having a clear understanding um, of the responsibilities of the lenders and the creditors, and clarity on, on the consumer's part as to what they should uh, expect and, and what they deserve uh, as they engage in that marketplace. So a lot of information about that. Congress did put out uh, as well uh, the economic impact payments 
And uh, many of you might wonder, what does the CFPB have to do with that? Certainly, um, Treasury's responsibility was getting those funds out to consumers. But given our relationships uh, with vulnerable consumers in different populations, we've worked very hard uh, to support the IRS um, and, and working with other uh, social service providers from Social Security Administration and USDA how can we make sure that those that are entitled to those payments actually can get those payments? We also issued a, a uh, interim final rulemaking around prepaid cards and enabling uh, Treasury to actually, and, and other uh, government officials and government agencies to issue uh, these kinds of payments via prepaid cards uh, a little differently than, than they can do on a regular basis. So. Um, taking those steps, being proactive, really engaging with our partners and doing what we can to, again, provide that clarity and provide um, options for people that are going to make sense to try to get those payments out is, a, again, one example. Um, I, I also will talk uh, it's later in my remarks, but I think it makes a lot of sense here on, on housing in general and, and what we have done. Um, it was in response to really stakeholder feedback. Again, how do we align what all of the federal agencies are doing in the housing space? Uh, the CFPB does not have uh, a responsibility really in the, in the rental space, but Congress did in the CARES Act provide protections for renters that HUD and that uh, FHFA needed to carry out. And stakeholders were starting to point out uh, discrepancies, uh, they were they were minor, um, but it's certainly our intention to overcome them with how each of the federal agencies talked about things or even the timing of what we were managing to get out in our uh, various communications because we were on slightly different timelines because some of us can, can act a little faster than others based on our, our processes uh, and the number of coordination points. So we uh, talked uh, about this and HUD, FHFA, and the CFPB pulled together consumerfinance.gov slash housing as the central website uh, to uh, provide the federal government's information to uh, consumers and to industry about what's expected and, and particularly around uh, CARES Act compliance and CARES Act uh, rights and forbearance. That was a, a huge area of making sure that we were all saying the same thing. And our partners at USDA and VA as well coming together with us on that. And in fact, even state regulators, we pulled in information from state regulators onto that website. We continue to look to build on it and really appreciate the feedback we're getting uh, from stakeholders on continuing to improve that. And as I said, that the best thing um, that I can say about how this messaging has worked well is when stakeholders are further pushing out that information and we can all speak uh, in, in a unified way about interpretations about what the law requires and as I said, what consumers rights are. So that housing website, I think is a fantastic um, evolution and, and a good example of how we will uh, continue to come together. And I was proud uh, as the head of the CFPB to host that site and really say, yes, we want consumers coming to us. And so we, are, we are hosting that and managing it and will continue to improve upon it and support it going forward. Uh, it's also important to note, uh, while education and, and getting this information out and providing clarity uh, to regulated industry and in, in the myriad ways that we have done that in terms of guidance documents, we continue to carry out our supervisory responsibility and take enforcement action. Um, we looked for, again, uh, the opportunity to engage with companies uh, to help them help their consumers during this time, help them help their customers. Uh, and so a lot of guidance was issued on that, some flexibility around uh, timelines and deadlines for regulatory compliance issues. But all of that, again, is aimed at being, uh, at promoting things that are consumer beneficial and aimed at uh, accommodating uh, the, the real challenges in the operating world that we're all facing course, we're in this virtual conference right now, and that's why, because we don't have the opportunity to be together. We're having call centers that are not uh, operating and people are managing to operate from home, there are challenges that institutions faced, uh, and frankly, that consumer advocates uh, and advocacy organizations have faced in continuing to provide services uh, to Americans across the country during this time. Uh, 
Um, but all of that, as I said, is aimed at uh, improving uh, the, the position for consumers. Those who are uh, not interested in supporting their customers, in supporting consumers, in complying with the law and looking for ways uh, to, to continue to help consumers, we will take action against them. Uh, I, I have uh, certainly renewed many times over my commitment to using the enforcement tool that Congress gave the agency. Uh, we absolutely have a, a rigorous commitment to enforce the law, to take action against bad actors, to continue to um, engage in uh, investigative work and to uh, get remedies and, and, and um, resources for consumers uh, who deserve that uh, when they've been taken advantage of. There, there are, uh, unfortunately, in any situation we find uh, those who are scammers uh, engaged in fraud, seeking to take advantage, uh, particularly of those who are most vulnerable and who are struggling uh, during this time. So I can assure you that violations of law will not be to tolerated. We have a number of, of avenues by which we get information about what is happening uh, in the financial marketplace said through our examiners uh, who continue to go out to institutions and ensure that compliance is happening through our investigators who also are looking at media reports and talking to partners at the state and local level and federal level as well uh, looking at what observations we have about fraud that's taking place uh, or scams that are in place and so pulling that together and that information together uh, engaging in investigations and suing entities that, um, you know, that in a public way, frankly, puts out there that uh, this is behavior that's not acceptable uh, in, in, well, in our country today, certainly. Uh, so we have continued to take uh, enforcement action. I'd also highlight briefly the um, complaints database that the Bureau manages. Uh, it is uh, a capability that, that Congress uh, told us was going to be important, and it really does inform all of our activity from education, uh, regulation, supervision, and enforcement. Uh, we look carefully at that complaint information that comes direct from consumers. Uh, we support the ability of uh, lenders and creditors to get answers back about uh, those complaints. And uh, we also use that to inform, again, where should we investigate? Uh, where is there a question or an issue that is happening out there that probably needs clarification? Uh, we have gotten uh, significant use uh, compared historically uh, in uh, the pandemic time. So record complaints uh, for our system um, in March and then April, May uh, and June. So we the highest month that we uh, uh, successively they've each set records uh, for our system uh, but June is now our, our high water mark in terms of uh, complaints. So we got over 45,000 in, in June. And so in terms of, uh, we'll talk a little bit later, I think, uh, Eric, on, on that, or even later this week, we do have a, a highlight a highlighting event on the complaint system and what we've seen during this time. But there's, um, I think, some, some ties to what we have historically seen because credit reporting uh, is an area where there continues to be a lot of um, increased interest by consumers appropriately. It has a huge impact on their lives. So that continues to be an area of, of complaint uh, and concern. But also just related to COVID-19, mortgages were an area that, that we had not seen a lot of inquiries about in terms of being the highest or top level. Uh, early on in March and April, it was. And frankly, that makes sense given what the CARES Act uh, provided to consumers and, and where questions were around uh, forbearance options and what those look like. So we spent a lot of time on those issues through our complaint system. Uh, last, I would just again circle back around to our rulemaking agenda. And I know um, we've had a number of conversations, Eric, uh, you facilitated some in the past as well around the qualified mortgage ability to repay rule. Um, we have got uh, the opportunity to talk a little bit more about that. I'm incredibly proud that the Bureau uh, in responding, as I said, so uh, with great agility and and very much uh, on point in terms of what we're seeing in the market during the pandemic, taking action on those things while keeping our regulatory agenda moving forward. And we've made a lot of progress in issuing 
notice of proposed rulemakings that are now out for comment uh, on the QM rule. So that is um, also an exciting thing uh, to talk a little bit more about and recognizing how important it is to provide that stability going forward for the marketplace and clarity for the, for the future beyond uh, the GSE patch. Uh, so that really uh, concludes at least what I, what I would cover at this point in time and, and look forward to the conversation. Great. Director, thank you so much. And uh, I would say there is so much to unpack there that we could spend hours uh, talking about this. And so that was my biggest challenge, figuring out how to condense that because I use that phrase, an agency at work. And it seems that every day or two, and for those who are on the call who focus on the CFPB as well on a daily basis or in, in their day-to-day -day jobs, every day or two, there's a bulletin, a rulemaking, guidance and initiative and none of these is a throwaway item each has impact um it, it's uh the rules are incredibly important the actions taken in response to COVID have been incredibly important and then the day-to-day -day business of the bureau you mentioned the rulemakings we'll get to that all of these have such an impact particularly in light of some of the challenges of COVID and how they exacerbate uh the 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 issues that many consumers are facing. And so I, I, I want to start off now, even today, this morning, I got a bulletin as I always do and open it up. And the, the Bureau uh, issued its Making Ends Meet survey. And it was incredibly eye-opening. I just want to give a few stats that really highlight, because it, it's one thing to talk about what's happening on a systemic basis. But from a consumer perspective, for those who are, are struggling, particularly those who are financially vulnerable or not as financially um, uh, empowered or educated, they don't know where to turn. And those are the ones who need protection the most. Go back to Dodd-Frank. This is 10 years post-Dodd-Frank. We see uh, what what the impact of the Bureau has been. We understand why the Bureau was formed coming out of the, the financial crisis. But the Making Ends Meet survey, and this was as of, I think, 2019, right? Mm -hmm. So even before the pandemic, I'll just read a few stats. 52% uh, uh, of people, and these are, I think, ones with credit records, reported they could cover expenses for two months or less if they lost their main source of income. And think about how important that is in the current environment when we have so much uh, employment and income loss and, and dislocation or curtailment. Uh, also, 40% um, of U.S. consumers reported they had difficulty paying a bill or expense in the previous year. And that number, I think, was 18% for those making more than 100000 So this is not an issue that's relegated just to low to moderate income people. You and I, Director, have talked about the notion of cost burden and how people live their financial lives and what it means to be empowered and to have the, the knowledge and tools to take, uh, to take control of those, at least to a, a much greater extent than many do. And I, I want to touch on one of your biggest initiatives, the Start Small Save Up initiative and how mm -hmm. this ties in. Um, finally, uh, when asked how they handled uh, a difficulty paying a bill or expense, half of the responses said they had to borrow, either formally or informally. And that also raises issues about access to credit and on what terms and what are the resources. All of these are, again, for those who do this on a day-to-day -day basis, false, you know, right square in the mission of the uh, of the bureau. So, uh, you know, let's let's start with that. The uh, making ends meet survey, how that ties into some of the information that you have and the collaboration that you have with other agencies, and how it ties into your start small save up initiative, which uh, really, as I said, really um, is uh, is right on point for the needs of many consumers today. Yeah, thank you for for um, actually recognizing that that came out today and giving us a chance to talk about it briefly and highlight it because it is an important uh, capability. We've got a fantastic group of economists here at the Bureau uh, in our Office of Research, and that's something that I really also want to highlight and, and think about. We've been developing a research agenda that we can broaden and really bring the academic community in in a deeper way to say, hey, this is where we see gaps and issues. This is what we want to understand better. But the importance of the Making Ends Meet survey, and frankly, a number of tools that uh, from the Federal Reserve uh, has had over the years, the Survey of Household Economics and Decision Making is, is really their uh, kind of watershed project over, over consumer finance. And thinking about how we tie this together to have uh, a view over time of trends and issues and and really the state of the American consumer, how are American consumers doing, 
and then enabling policy makers to make decisions based on that and looking at that information. Um, so we've been doing the Making Ends Meet survey now for quite some time. It does uh, tell us, uh, as I said, a, a decent amount, as you said, that, that makes us think about uh, the pandemic's impact and, and we see it, it's real. Uh, there are a number of Americans who are hurting uh, and particularly as you think about uh, the challenges that public health officials are having with uh, opening and closing or opening more or less uh, and, and those changes uh, for businesses to respond to that, uh, to think about how to help their employees and keep employees on board. Uh, so I, I do firmly believe that the CFPB uh, has a strong role in, in kind of creating that picture in providing an accurate picture over time of how American consumers are doing and then helping using that to inform again how we go about uh, our efforts in education and regulation. And so uh, the Making Ends Meet survey is, is a beginning of that. We're really thinking about a consumer index that we can even make a, a little more accessible uh, to Americans and, and to the media and, and then use that as again a basis to talk about things like savings and financial well-being. Um, so those are things that we're we're working uh, deeply on and, and uh, talking to the Fed and others because there's a lot of information across the federal government that bears on this um, that uh, some that's not in our wheelhouse but that's interesting. Again, thinking about prices, uh, the cost of goods and the cost of living dynamics that play out in terms of how consumers are doing and how they feel uh, about their financial well-being. So uh, it's a it's an important topic and it does fit right into savings. Uh, we have a little bit pause, start small, save up because you've got people that are that are uh, hurting right now. But but it is a message that we're thinking about. How do we bring that back into the picture um, as people get back on their feet? I'd also say so there's pretty interesting uh, data out there about people paying down debt during this time. Um, so you think about, again, what opportunities they're taking uh, based on reduced expenses because they're cooking more and they're at home and they're not, you know, we, we aren't going to concerts or events that uh, you can take those funds and put them somewhere else. So continuing to think about all of those household economics dynamics and how we can help consumers uh, think about them and make the best decisions for themselves. It's, it, it's uh, I, I appreciate that. It's um... And we'll touch on that when it gets to mortgage, because that's typically the largest expense in any uh, any consumer's financial lifetime. And we're at record low interest rates, and yet there are those who are on the verge of losing their homes, but for forbearance, or that might be the next shoe to drop. And we'll talk about that uh, in just a bit. Um, and also, uh, at, at such a time, we don't know where COVID will take us. We don't know what it's going to look like on the other side or when that will come. And this is a it's a month to month question, if not a day to day question for so many people who don't have those resources. Uh, so figuring out what can be brought to bear and how you can take a dollar of aid and best deliver it from the government or other sources. I, I know that that's something that I've talked about with you and with uh, with the team at the Bureau as well, among other stakeholders. The um, the resources that are on the website, if anyone has not taken a look, the ones that, that you mentioned, director. Uh, they're vast. I, I've even got my nine-year-old. Try, I'm trying to convince him to take the money courses so that when he does get out of college, maybe he can you know, be educated and, and uh, go on his own balance sheet. Um, but they're tremendous. And the mortgage landing page that you mentioned, I know that uh, it was really appreciated. I'm part of a collaborative that cuts across many different stakeholders in the mortgage industry, the mortgage finance industry. So it's uh, consumer advocates, industry trade groups, uh, industry participants, so lenders and, and uh, other other creditors, servicers, uh, folks from different think tanks, and it's um, it really has been a SWAT team. And I know that that uh, the formation of the mortgage landing page and the collaboration with the other key agencies and setting setting that up in order to give direction and clarity and to stay on top of that as a living breathing document or a living breathing resource really was appreciated and, and it's uh, it, it's provided meaningful help. Uh, to people who don't know where to turn. And as you mentioned, uh, it, it seems that there's been an effort to disseminate that information. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that, about efforts to spread that message to people who really uh, may not know about it, but need to? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a huge part of the conversation that, that we've had since I arrived, uh, actually in December 2018. Um, the Bureau prided itself, and I think has done uh, fantastic work in looking at 
doing actual research about what works in financial education, uh, what messages are needed, uh, where a gap is in terms of the information that's widely available out there, um, and trying to figure out how we, again, fit that need and then disseminate it. Uh, we've had fantastic partnerships, uh, for example, with library systems, because a lot of people thought about libraries as a, at least a physical place in the community where you can go for information. And so they were a huge financial literacy efforts. Of course, the pandemic hits and uh, people cannot physically go to the library. And so how do we further think about and disseminate things electronically? How do we make it available um, in not just a, a format that's intended to be printed out, but, but how do we leverage uh, technology partners or others in financial services or consumer advocates or fintech companies that are particularly creative and want to push this out in new and different ways? So I can tell you it is still very much a work in progress as to how we get um, the right influencers and social media channels and dissemination of that information. But we have uh, certainly done everything we can to, to continue to highlight it for stakeholders. Uh, there are a number of banks and credit unions that are kind of testing things out and talking to us about uh, using our resources. And then those federal partners. I mean, you look at the, um, the housing website too. Uh, we did our very quick video uh, on the CARES Act forbearance program uh, within a week of enactment, that video was produced and released. Uh, and HUD saw it and said, wow, you know, can, can we add our logo to that and get that out there as well? And it, the, the answer is, is always going to be yes from me. Uh, I want to get to as wide a distribution as possible to get the information in the hands of those who need it. And so that's something that, um, you know, again, anybody who's listening, if you've got ideas to help us get this stuff out there, and I, I'd also put a plug for our advisory uh, committee members, uh, incredibly helpful. Uh, you know, companies out in California, I won't call people out, but they, they've they been uh, helping us and thinking about this and promoting it. Uh, we've got some, um, you know, community banks in Florida that, that are putting out uh, regular blogs and looking at ways to, again, get the information out. So really as much uh, partnership as we can um, through all these channels, I think is is really important. Uh, you know, you touch on something, you mentioned the advisory committees and also the task force that the Bureau set up. And I want to, I, I want to put a pin in that, uh, talk about mortgage now, because I know that that's a very important uh, part of the Bureau's work. I, I know I, it's been a privilege to be part of it. Uh, I can speak for myself and other CAB members, the Consumer Advisory Board members. There's There are uh, three other uh, advisory committees as well, but I know that, that those committees and the task force uh, play an important role for the Bureau. And I, I want to turn to those a bit later. I want to move for just for a moment on to and stay on um, uh, some of the rulemaking and tied into mortgage, tied into the needs during the pandemic. And there are, are a few in particular that I know have been tremendously impactful. One of them is a notice of proposed rulemaking for the qualified mortgage rule and, and tied to, as you mentioned, the QM patch. And for those who don't know, these are these might be the key lending rules that dictate uh, certain guardrails and certain requirements in order to ensure that borrowers who do take out mortgage credit have the ability to sustain the loan, the ability to repay the loan. Clearly, that has its roots in uh, coming out of the financial crisis, um, but that really is maybe the key lending regulation. And then next also is one that I was very pleased to see, the interim final rule on loss mitigation <laughs> options, because in this pandemic, and I'll, I'll say again, the responsiveness of, of the CFPB and some of the other government agencies as well to the needs of consumers and industry and the economy, um, without the, the responsiveness that you've shown, you'd be in real trouble. And people have different opinions as to the right way to go about it, but the responsiveness is key, I think, for any, whatever lens someone looks through. And um, so, um, Th those rules, I think, are tremendously important, not just uh, in response to the pandemic, but also carrying out that day-to-day -day business of the Bureau. So uh, the qualified mortgage rule, can you talk a bit about that? And I, it was a very long process that even predated uh, your directorship, but I know the amount of work that you've engaged in and the team have, has engaged in uh, with respect to the QM rule and why that's so important at this point in particular. And then let's talk about the other shoe to drop, which what happens when we get through the pandemic and through the forbearance period when people are in a position to have to repay those amounts. Uh, definitely. Um, I'll say with respect to the, the QM rule, 
I see an important rulemaking that uh, Congress did require in the Dodd-Frank Act, uh, ensuring that debt and income uh, are considered and verified in the process of, of mortgage. And so that is, um, and then and then the allowance there in terms of trying to bring um, some stability and standard with a qualified mortgage, a, a mortgage that then is uh, assumed to have done the ability to repay by virtue of the process that it was um, that the mortgage was was uh, issued under. The the GSE patch is really saying, okay, Fannie and Freddie are are large um, uh, backers of of mortgages. They dictate uh, a lot of different um, processes around their underwriting for. Uh, those who are engaged in lending. And so that that was a recognition, uh, I suppose, of the um, extensive role they have in the mortgage market. Uh, but it was intended to be temporary, as, as you well know, and that it, it is a, uh, a, a bridge to uh, what at the time was assumed to be just a larger uh, adoption of the processes that the Bureau put into place in Appendix Q. So um, that uh, has not borne out. I would say to your point of the process that carried this through ever since the, the rule was issued in 2013, this is something that that uh, many um, market watchers, certainly the Bureau itself, have been gathering data on how is it working? Uh, how How is the mortgage market working? How is the QM um, uh, mechanism working? Uh, what is What is the impact of the GSE patch on that? And that started to in 2017 and 2018, the Bureau issued requests for information around this. In 2019, uh, very early January, I think I've been here a month, uh, we issued our assessment report of the QM rule that's required by statute two and acknowledged that, that the GSE patch was still a, a significant part of the market and um, uh, the non-QM uh, had not really developed uh, the way we expected it to. And so thinking about uh, where we were going to go with this was something I knew from from day one of my nomination that I would would need to grapple with and deal with. And we put out an advance notice of proposed rulemaking too last year saying, uh, we think we know a lot. We've been looking at this, but let's again continue to be transparent and engage and get stakeholder feedback back. And, and really those mechanisms uh, got a lot of entities together. As you said, Eric, you work uh, with a number of other stakeholders across the spectrum that care about the mortgage uh, market for consumers and how can we um, you know, come up with something that's gonna make sense moving forward, recognizing the patch is gonna expire. Uh, so it's it's really been a, a quite a road to get to the notices of proposed rulemaking that we issued uh, just a few, a few weeks ago uh, with 60 day comment periods uh, one is an extension of the patch just to align it with the final rule uh, that would move us forward, recognizing that um, there needs to be some transition here. Uh, having all of this in place and, and ready to transition, particularly also given uh, the pandemic, um, January is, is going to be uh, a little soon. It's going to come right. around the corner. Uh, right. But the opportunity to transition into uh, something that will replace it. and. We, we put a lot of thought into this too. I, I think there has been a lot of focus on and that the Bureau set that uh, debt to income ratio at 43% as um, the standard uh, for a qualified mortgage at, without the GSE patch. And so thinking about what that looks like, thinking about what that means, uh, thinking about uh, what goes into a, a good loan for a consumer and helps get uh, those who uh, can afford it into into housing that they own, and there are a lot of great things about home ownership, obviously, in terms of uh, what that does for wealth building and otherwise, and, and impacts on minority communities and their ability to to build wealth and pass down those homes to their families. So there's a lot to think about on this, but we did uh, lay out a, a path where um, the 43% DTI was was not. Um, a standard that made sense uh, in terms of where the market is and frankly in terms of what the ability to repay uh, requires in the statute and we put a proposal up that looks at pricing threshold uh, as you all know the difference between uh, APR and, and APOR and saying that pricing mechanism takes into account more things than just DTI about 
um, about the borrower. Uh, and so those are things that we I think it's a more holistic measure. Obviously, taking a lot of comment on that, we look forward to it. Um, there are a lot of nuances in this that you know we can't get into in a few minutes here, uh, but but I think uh, very much look forward to the rulemaking process on this and and trying to bring some resolution with an appropriate transition. I, you know, you say a, a lot of nuances. There's there's uh, over six years of nuances <laughs> based on it. You know, I, it's uh, it goes back to what we touched on earlier on. Um, the mission of a consumer uh, of the of the CFPB, you're taking, you're trying to make policy that works, that's feasible, that's operationally possible, uh, that has to account for millions and millions of consumers, each of whom is in a, a different situation from everyone else. And how do you do that? How do you make it work for the consumer? Make it work for industry so they can actually deliver the products to the consumers that consumers need and do it in a systemically safe and sound way. We talk about, we've had many conversations, you've been kind enough to let me go on and on about those three prongs and how important they are, but it all starts with the consumer. Um, on the QM rule, clearly uh, the notice of proposed rulemaking reflects conversations with stakeholders and including a diverse group of stakeholders who supported um, uh, one of the tests, the key tests that uh, is in the, in the proposed rule. And I think um, what's also important is that it's clear that, and I'm not saying this is a plug for the Bureau, I can say this with conviction, the Bureau and the team listened. Uh, they didn't disregard any suggestions outright. They tried to dig into those suggestions. They listened to caveats, uh, potential issues, and tried to solve for those. And um, I, I won't go uh, on and on about that anymore because I know that we're in the, in the middle of a comment period. Um, but that was that was meaningful to me as a stakeholder and as someone who does this all the time and also as a, a sort of a member of the cab who cares about carrying out the mission. Um, the also the other thing too that's important for some people listening is that this is not some arcane rule. Once again, this goes to for those who don't know, this goes to the heart of whether or not you can get a mortgage loan and what the terms of that loan will be and what you'll qualify for and at what rate. I mean, it really is the lifeblood of it. And so it's incredibly important. And I think one of the most important things too, bringing it back to COVID as we, we've talked about, and I know you know full well and the team knows, under the rule, one of the unintended consequences of the way it was structured is that there are many people, who, even if we get through COVID and reestablish an ability to sustain credit and repay their loans, the hard and fast rules of the way the qualified mortgage rule was defined, again, unintended, was that it would shut out otherwise credit worthy people from accessing new mortgage credit, even sustainable mortgage credit because of the hard and fast rules. And so I, hopefully whatever comes out of the rulemaking process will address that. I know that's one of the key points and that's been in square focus for the Bureau. So thank you for that. No, definitely. And I will put in a plug for that because we explicitly acknowledged it to your point that statute requires, and of course in a, in a responsible underwriting system, you need to take into account the individual's debt and income. Uh, and, and so how that's documented, how that's verified, to your point, that was all spelled out in, in great uh, excruciating detail in Appendix Q uh, in a way that um, probably went a little too far in terms of what industry could do and what might um, what, what options there might be uh, to take things into account. So one question specifically in the rule is around um, how we should take into account what you hope, at least for some consumers, will be a blip in time that is uh, a loss of income right now uh, that hopefully, again, they can recover to. But but in the hard and fast rules, uh, that is that is something that will absolutely affect their credit worthiness. So thinking about that uh, as it applies to those consumers that, that might be in that position. Uh, and then also just the notion that uh, we want to support, and I know we were, uh, we'll potentially get into it a little bit, but but alternative data and, and understanding better um, how, how uh, a lender could look at other information um, like you know, rental payments or, or other things, other data that is not classically part of a credit report uh, to utility bill payments, you know, how you can take that into account in a way that um, put a different lens on someone's credit worthiness and on their financial um, situation and then enable you to uh, deem them more credit worthy than you might have before. And so alternative data opportunities here, ways to think about this 
Uh, there are a lot of um, industry entities looking at it. There are uh, consumer advocate groups looking at it. We are continuing to do research in this space and, and want to uh, enable that. And so the QM rule does have a lot of questions around how to think about uh, not just debt and income, but and not just DTI, but residual income right. or other ways um, that stakeholders could come together or other standard stakeholders could develop that enable that verification of debt and income and, and uh, that picture of an individual's finances and, and uh, helping those who, who uh, should be able to get uh, a mortgage to get one and, and be able to own a home. So those are, you know, as you said, this is about real people and this is about uh, real opportunity and, and access to uh, the system that, that uh, is so important. Well, you know, so you mentioned I, now, since you mentioned it, I want to touch on it and then come back to the interim final rule, which again, for yeah. those, if people didn't see it, it's it's extremely important and something that we've been talking about all along, what happens at the end of forbearance. But uh, alternative forms of credit, alternative forms of underwriting, use of data, that's something I know that the Bureau has been focusing on. Uh, I've been fortunate to be part of the discussions as well. Just over time, I think I participated uh, two or three years ago in a um, uh in a forum or a seminar at the Bureau regarding this topic. But uh, you made it a priority in terms of uh, setting up the Office of Innovation, and you've come out with the advisory opinion uh, initiative as well in order to try and bring more technology uh, into the consumer finance world. One, to, to afford uh, new ways to look at credit that uh, are appropriate, and it, it's twofold, right? It's not, it's making sure that uh, lenders don't prey upon consumers, but it's also making sure that consumers are taking out sustainable loans. So it, it has a dual benefit. Um, but also, what are the guardrails around that? So I know that, that that's a big uh, focus for the Bureau, if you can talk a bit about that. Uh, that. That's something, especially going forward, as technology becomes more and more adept at this, can play a role in, um, in bringing credit where credit should be, but has not been traditionally. And that will especially help underserved communities. Uh, it's definitely the case, and uh, as many of you know, I, I chair the FFIC right now, the body where all of the regulators in the financial space come together and, and look at uh, standards and guidance. We issued uh, some a joint statement uh, last year about alternative data, and I know Brian Brooks, also a, the uh, acting comptroller, has been publicly talking about the uh, you know the the possibilities, but but also the potential uh, pitfalls of um, some of the AI uh, applications and underwriting. And so that's something, again, that all of us as regulators are very conscious of. Uh, a lot of stakeholders interested in how this can come out. And from the Bureau's standpoint, we're looking to facilitate things that are consumer beneficial. And that is the heart of our innovation policies and efforts. Uh, we are uh, really excited uh, that we continue to get applications from entities where, one, you, you have some newer players in this space who don't have the deep history that a bank would have over what consumer finance law requires at the federal level. Uh, you have uh, slightly different or creative, um, you know, applications that uh, don't quite fit into the regulations, trying to understand even when those entities want to comply, well, how, you know, how, how are we going to interpret that and, and is that compliance what they want to do? Um, so those are conversations that we have a responsibility to facilitate and that, as I said, consumer beneficial outcomes are what we're looking for here. Uh, and so we have uh, an Office of Innovation that's taking all of that into account. We've got some promising um, uh, areas where, where we've been issuing things. Uh, we actually recently approved an application uh, for uh, enabling employers uh, to have emergency savings um, uh, investments and support similar to a 401k. So letting people uh, opt out rather than opt into emergency savings and then working with us to research how that would work. And the employers want to actually put money against their employees um, engaging in and having emergency savings. So I think that's a hugely, again, promising thing. And there are some questions about whether or not that was okay under consumer finance law. So things like that are what we're talking about. Uh, the opportunity for um, mortgage lenders to actually partner with housing counseling agencies in a way that does not 
uh, end up in in a um, uh, a marketing relationship that's inappropriate because there are some things under RESPA that that are limited there. So all of those kinds of things again are what we're talking about, and we've got a, some some great uh, again more uh, coming out on that front, and with the advisory opinions too. Again, just looking to provide clarity to the market so that they can continue to accommodate consumers' needs and um, exciting exciting stuff. That's great. Actually, that's a good segue. I want to note we have about 10 minutes and there's there's three topics I want to hit, but that's a great segue um, in terms of partnering with housing counselors and once again, the interim final rule on loss mitigation options. This notion of what do consumers do when they've gotten out of forbearance, if, they've, if, if they're able to sustain a payment, if they're not. The interim final rule was important. Can you talk just a bit about that and then also how you're going to look at that, that when that shoe drops, that very uh, key part of what the consumer landscape is going to look like going forward? Yeah, it's, it is hugely important. And I would say, again, one one thing that the Bureau um, came responsible for when it was created, it, and, and it was a recent rule, was a mortgage servicing rule. So um, we, we took that over. There are a lot of requirements there, appropriately, a lot of protections for consumers who uh, may be seeking options for forbearance, take any situation you have from loss of income and, and not necessarily the pandemic, but a disaster. Uh, what does a lender need to tell that consumer in terms of the waterfall options that they have, uh, timelines around those disclosures, timelines and opportunities for consumers to actually have gating process that uh, protects them from uh, foreclosure, uh, too early in the process. So all of those kinds of things are outlined in that mortgage servicing rule. Uh, but but what came to be true, certainly in the pandemic, is there were a lot of people seeking uh, the option under the CARES Act uh, that Congress provided that was very clear. Um, and so we, we were working very closely with FHFA and HUD, trying to understand what their flexibilities were, what they were going to direct uh, servicers that service their loans to do, and looking at the mortgage servicing rule and realizing that when someone calls their servicer and says, okay, great, I get three months where I don't have to pay, um, and I'm going to work through that, um, that is something that, um, you know, they, they really needed to work through. And, and so the, what the mortgage servicing rule would require is actually then sending disclosures to the consumer who thinks everything's fine, um, but those might appear to be in conflict because they would start laying out their options for um, uh, forbearance payment down the line. And um, there was also a lot of question from people, okay, what happens after the three months? And as I said, the mortgage servicing rule has very specific timelines and process for that. What uh, FHFA uh, in particular and HUD was looking at is, we just want to say we believe it's consumer beneficial to roll those payments to the end of the mortgage term. Uh, someone will not have to deal with a lump sum payment after a short forbearance because uh, that's unlikely to be something that's going to work for them anyway. Um, how can we not send uh, confusing messages or mixed messages to consumers over this? And so that's what that interim final rule was about. I can tell you too that we are looking very closely at the mortgage servicing rule when it comes to this pandemic and disasters and just thinking about is there are there things that we need to do that will enable this uh, more easily in the future to change the way this happens uh, again when it'll be beneficial to consumers. That, that's incredibly important because again as we've talked about and I think on the last uh, public convening of the cab was made mention that if you provide this relief to people who are in such need right now, and again, I use the word, it's often overused, but really now it's appropriate in an unprecedented way. And once you get through in providing them that relief, you don't create a repayment option that is sustainable, especially when a sustainable option exists that works for all involved, then you've just, you've just delayed the pain when you could actually alleviate the pain. And I, I appreciate that the Bureau is looking at that and thinking of it in that way. Uh, and what else they can do proactively looking going forward, because we will have hurricanes. I hope we never have another pandemic, but just in case, uh, you know, better to play offense than defense. Um, a few more minutes, and I, I want to tie it out two quick things, if we could. Uh, uh, protecting vulnerable communities, elder fraud, uh, looking at underserved populations, minority borrowers, low to moderate income borrowers, protecting against scams. 
Uh, we don't have nearly enough time to talk about it because those could take hours, but please look on the Bureau website if you're uh, watching. There's, again, a tremendous amount of resources. So I want to go with that, the advisory committees and task force, and then we'll wind it up because I know everyone's time is very valuable, especially yours. Thank you for that. We have done a tremendous amount of work um, in general as an agency, but certainly uh, recognizing the dynamics of the pandemic and the economic impacts, particularly on vulnerable populations. I was uh, thinking of the elder fraud prevention and response networks that the Bureau supports. Um, they're local organizations basically coming together, so social services, law enforcement, financial institutions locally, and looking to watch out for older Americans, uh, identifying fraud and trying to catch it before money uh, changes hands, for example, and so highlighting uh, how that happens, how that works, sharing information about it, about the schemes, providing that to federal agencies as well. So actually recognizing that the pandemic really did lead to uh, new avenues, frankly, new uh, vectors for fraudsters to actually try uh, we have put out our new guidance on that, uh, helping communities how to develop those networks, how to sustain those networks. And so that's a, a great example of a, of a specific uh, population and a specific action that the Bureau has, but we really do have a lot of resources on our website geared at uh, all different populations. That's, uh, I know we talked about that. I think it was just in June you put that mm -hmm. out, that guidance. Um, I, I think it takes a special kind of malice to prey upon uh, consumers during this period of time in the pandemic. It takes what is already a bad act, and I think it uh, increases uh, in increases it exponentially. And so it's great to see the Bureau and the other agencies take that seriously, because it's, it's a time when uh, everyone is on edge and particularly exposed. And uh, it's great to see that work that the Bureau's done that. Also, I think other uh, populations, low to moderate income individuals who don't have the wherewithal uh, to face the pandemic and who are wondering where the next dollar is coming from. Do they have to choose between food, uh, shelter, if they're, if for some reason they have uh, other kinds of payments, student loans, credit cards. Also, the work that you've done to, um, to inform those populations, those, those individuals and families where to turn and what to do when they're faced with these struggles and don't know uh, what what relief is available to them. What uh, I know that the Bureau's done a lot of work on that and as well, maybe we can speak to that too. Oh, absolutely. Uh, I, I mentioned, I believe earlier, the economic impact payments uh, that Congress provided through the CARES Act. Treasury uh, distributes those funds, IRS and, and the Bureau of the Fiscal Service but recognizing that there are a lot of people eligible for those funds who still don't know about it. Uh, I learned uh, fairly recently, actually, after the financial crisis, there were uh, millions of dollars that were not distributed to people that, that were estimated were actually eligible. So the Bureau has partnered with, with Treasury on a campaign to reach those individuals. We're working with all kinds of stakeholder groups uh, to do that. Uh, we estimate, again, there are millions of Americans that have not still uh, they're not reachable and we haven't gotten to them with the resources they're entitled to. Uh, so that's one example. And we did do a video that is distributed on that, but we also know some of these people are not people we can reach through those means. So we're being creative about how to reach them and absolutely want to, to reach as many as we can. And, and it, that's true of all of our resources, certainly, and, and partnering is a, a huge part of that. There are a lot of Again, social service organizations, advocacy organizations, uh, local organizations that are helping us. That's great. Thank you, Director. It's, uh, I know we're reaching the top of the hour uh, or the end of the hour. And uh, at the top of the conversation, we touched base a little bit on the advisory committees and the task force. And uh, if you can share your thoughts on the important work that uh, that those groups do. I know, again, I've been, uh, it's been a privilege to be part of those and to work with the Bureau in that capacity. But what are your thoughts about the role that they play and what uh, information you glean from them and how they help the Bureau do its work? And also with respect to the task force, I know that that's expected to really, um, really give some very important information and feedback to the Bureau. Uh, and maybe let us know how that works into your view of the the Bureau now and how it uh, how you'd like to see it evolve during your tenure. 
Uh, thank you for that. And certainly for your service on the CAB, it has been uh, truly a pleasure uh, in this position to interact with our advisory board and council members. We, uh, early in my tenure, I, I did a little bit of a revamp so that we get fresh membership every year, but we also get uh, the opportunity for folks to stay two years. And so they, they get the opportunity to uh, be engaged once they've learned the ropes and, and continue to give. Um, so we were conscious of the cycle that made sense bringing in different expertise based on the broad activities that, that the Bureau is engaged in, and a particular focus too on smaller entities, uh, community banks and, and credit unions that are smaller, so that we have that perspective from those regulated entities, even where we don't supervise or enforce. It's a, an important uh, part of the financial system in this country that is um, a valuable resource to us. So I have really enjoyed working with the boards and councils getting their insights, uh, same with the academic community too. We've got an academic research council. Um, what we thought about with the task force really though, is getting a, a group of experts together. We ran a competitive process uh, last December, recognizing 10 years uh, since the Dodd-Frank Act was enacted and recognizing frankly that many of the consumer finance laws are from the 1970s. And when we talk about technology evolution, when we talk about the way that Americans today interact with financial services and financial products, so much has changed. Um, this is an area, particularly in the area of disclosures, uh, where we are really thinking about what does the future look like? What might make sense? And so the task force was really uh, born of that conversation. The Bureau and, and the Bureau staff do fantastic work and obviously have great expertise and are gonna help um, uh, with the task force members uh, in developing uh, at least the background of what uh, the environment is and what some considerations might be. And there's a lot to channel there, but getting a, a few experts together that are outside of the day-to-day -day workings of the Bureau was really what we were thinking about. Uh, longer term viewpoint, opportunities to think about law and regulations in a different way. And you know, their, their job is to come up with some recommendations that I may or may not take. Um, so it is it is a process that we put into place from that standpoint. And I'm excited to see what uh, they come up with. We're having a public hearing this week too as part of Consumer Financial Protection Week. Uh, so really some great work there to lay out what the agenda uh, could be for the future of the agency, uh, in addition to the many things that we're uh, working on on a regular and ongoing basis. That's great. And, and I think having the opportunity for open feedback, I know we have the public convenings as well. Um, I, Imagine it's, I say this as a consumer, not just a stakeholder, but it's good to be able to deliver that kind of feedback and have those conversations out in the open. Uh, it's also good, I think, that the Bureau is not beholden to the advisory committees or the task forces, uh, or the task force, but it's just another avenue for the Bureau to, to bring in that outside perspective to help it uh, carry out its mission. So I, I'm thankful for that element of the Bureau, and um, I look forward to seeing what comes out of that as well. So, uh, Director, I want to, now that we, we have reached the top of the hour, um, I want to uh, say thank you once again for joining us today and for sharing your thoughts and insights uh, for the work that you've done to lead the CFPB as director. Uh, what you and the Bureau do, it really does impact the lives of everyone in the country. And the more that people are aware of the work that the Bureau does and the resources it provides, I think the, clearly the better equipped consumers will be to manage their finances to engage the marketplace and understand their rights and really weather periods of financial struggle and crisis like the one that we're in right now. Mm -hmm. um, we'd also like to thank the audience for joining us today and to find out more about the Bureau's work and access the many resources that are available to help consumers, please visit consumerfinance.gov. And we also encourage you to visit milkeninstitute.org to learn more about uh, the work that the Milken Institute is doing in response to the challenges of the day and how to get involved. And resources include a COVID-19 treatment and vaccine tracker uh, and access to all of our previous, previous weekly conference calls, including an, uh, an ongoing podcast series featuring our chairman, Mike Milken, along with an array of global thought leaders and much, much more. You can also email me at ekaplan at milkeninstitute.org or contact the Institute through our website if you'd like to learn more about the work that we're doing here at the Milken Institute. So, Director, once again, I know your time is very valuable. It's a busy week for you during Consumer Financial Protection Week. And I want to thank you for taking the time to speak with us today uh, and also, again, to those who tuned in. Have a great day. Stay safe and well and look forward to talking again soon. Thank you. You as well. Thank you to all. <laughs>